Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books and Critical Theory. It's a podcast that's part of the New Books Network. On this episode, I'm talking to Marcos Gonzalez Hernando and Jerry Mitchell, who are the authors of Uncomfortably Off Why the Top 10% of Earners Should Care About Inequality. Uh, so, welcome both uh, to the podcast. It's, it's great uh, to have you on talking about this. Uh, I think incredibly important uh, and incredibly uh, timely book. Uh, a book that I think um, is relevant, obviously, in Britain in the context of inequality uh, and politics and society in Britain, but actually speaks to so many uh, different global um, societies. Um, and I suppose the place to start really is with the title. Um, and I wonder, maybe we'll start with you, Marcos. Could you kind of introduce who um, the protagonists of the book are? Who are the top 10%? Um, who are we who are we talking about here? Um, yes, sure. So the top ten percent of earners uh, are interesting group for several reasons. One of them is that if you look at uh, all the research on inequality, all the research on sociology, attitudes, etc., uh, when you try to group different parts of the population to try and understand how the variable of income interacts with others. Generally, you make the cut of the top 10%, or so in deciles, basically. But that top decile is perhaps the most diverse of all, all the other deciles because it includes people who, for example, in the case of the UK, and as a personal income just above around £60,000 per year, and billionaires. So uh, this group is incredibly diverse, but at the same time, it has many things that uh, bring them together in particular for example that they tend to share in terms of variables that identify them uh the status as professionals or and managers and a high degree of education e is spent in education so even though most professionals and managers are not part of the top 10 percent and uh, most of the top 10 percent are professionals and managers um and uh, as i said before this group includes People who, uh, say, live in larger cities, are uh, highly achieving professionals and managers, but also billionaires. So, um, yeah, it's an incredibly diverse group, I'd say. Yeah, I found it really interesting, the focus on um, the top 10%. Uh, I think we're, we're quite used to, in the last, where are we, sort of uh, 15, maybe even 20 years, thinking about the 1%, you know, thinking about, um, as you've mentioned, you know, the sort of, ultra rich uh both in kind of politics society but also you know in terms of cultural representations uh perhaps as well but actually extending this and, and, and thinking about this top decile um is incredibly productive in, in various ways as we're gonna talk about um over the course of, of this episode the other thing i guess as a kind of introduction it, you both stake out really um kind of clearly um your sort of viewpoints and and i guess um, I was going to say the baggage you bring, but that's not the right word, is it? But the kind of backgrounds uh, you bring to the research. And maybe, uh, Jerry, you'd like to say, uh, to begin with, well, what is your kind of viewpoint? What's your approach to the research? And then we'll, we'll hear the same from Marcus. I think baggage is, is actually quite a good word. Um, well, my drive to write the book came out of um, sort of a long running interest in um, sort of break it down to three issues. Number one, obviously, inequality. Um, but as importantly, uh, number two, the lack of, um, so I spent almost 11 years working on studying and then working at LSE. Um, and number two is really the lack of integration of political and economic factors and our analysis of modern society and the, and the particularly lack of critical political economics. So, you know, academics from one discipline are not always given the confidence and tools to ask difficult questions of economics, you know, in economics, when I studied and researched and it may well have changed. Um, it is sort of portrayed as some kind of natural science um, rather than coming with a whole load of assumptions just like any other subject and you know none of this was crit critiqued how it translated into wider society um, and then when I came out of academia um, I got involved in local politics some time after and I found the same thing there no one um, had the confidence you know so you've gone from some very privileged and entitled context and then you're in a lo local politics where it's a combination of people in terms of education and, and experiences um, the same sort of lack of confidence in being able to critique, particularly economics. Um, and, 
thirdly, um, from, from a very personal experience, that's where the baggage comes in. Um, personally experienced the top 10% ways of thinking and their consequences. So meritocratic explanations of success would be one of them. Um, you know, I've spent years um, studying others in, you know, in the us and them, um, but there was no inter interrogating, as we put it in the book, of the us. Um, there was a sort of, as we put it in the book, a tacit acceptance um, of a commonly held but rarely voiced view that if you're a, a high income earner, you've proven yourself worthy of being in charge of your own life and politics and the state should just leave you be. And, and that was as true of, you know, the lecturers who were teaching us and, the, you know, the mentors that we had doing our PhDs and and, and whatever um, uh, as anyone else. So this book is arguing that's absolutely wrong. The so, You know, the social structures affect the lives of us as well as them. And so, you know, that comes with a whole load of problems. But, um, you know, the world that we were we were in and Marx is still in and you're in um, still needs to be um, studied. And just to finally, I'd say the book comes from the reality of precarity um, of the workplace and the an associated culture that can't really accommodate the differences and in inequalities we research, which is such an irony. So just as a little example, halfway through my sort of last research contract at LSE, um, I had my first child and I was asked to go to uh, back to complete the project when actually I wasn't really ready. She was three months old. Um, and then because of that, um, you know, rite of passage in my life, that transition, I had to move out of London. And then the precarity of the competitive academic culture was no longer feasible and, and no longer a, a appealed for me. So for all those reasons, baggage included, I'm, I was very passionate about writing something that would encourage talking and questioning ac across income groups, across occupational groups, about the political decisions that affect us, us all. And what about you, Marcus? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think uh, Jerry uh, covered a lot of what I was about to say. I just wanted to highlight a point that she made that is something that we reflect on in the book as well, which is the fact that uh, in academia and in the world of uh, sort of left of center think tanks, which is where we met initially, um, we tend to uh, start from, as you said before, we tend to focus in social policy either on the billionaires, the top of the top 1%, or on those who are struggling. So we almost tacitly tend to kind of um, exclude ourselves from being part of the analysis because uh, if you think about, say, the senior figures in those kind of institutions, they are part of the top 10% as well. And as Jerry said, uh, there's sort of this implicit tacit understanding that uh, people like that have, you know, proven themselves to be able to be uh, to take care of their own lives, so the state and politics and policy should leave them be. Uh, we part of the point of the book is to argue that uh, if that was ever the case, it's definitely not the case anymore, and that politics and policy is affecting them, and vice versa, they are affect they they are affecting policy as well. So in my case as well, um, so also because I was, uh, I mean, this book came. Uh, in relation to a project that I was doing as I finished my PhD in sociology at Cambridge working on think tanks. Uh, so I had actually in the process of doing my own research on think tanks, I had interviewed uh, quite a bit of the elites of uh, British policymaking. Uh, but at the same time, just as I finished, I was really struggling to find a permanent job in academia, which is definitely a common case. And uh, being the son of uh, upwardly mobile uh, middle class doctors, uh, one could say. Uh, I definitely felt around the time that I was that we were thinking about writing the book that there's definitely a challenge around the social reproduction of the top ten percent. Uh, and uh, from the time when we started writing it, then came uh, the pandemic, furlough, etc., and uh, also had um, you know um, things in the UK like the. Uh, junior barrister strike, junior doctor strikes, not to mention the precarization in academia, etc., which I think makes it very topical. You sort of alluded, uh, I guess, both of you in, in different ways to um, how would I describe it? A kind of uh, dilemma that faces the top ten percent. On the one hand, both of you have talked about you know that kind of sense they have of their sort of security, and you know the sense that. Um, they've made it on their own efforts and, you know, the state should effectively kind of, you know, in some cases leave them alone, in other cases basically serve them um, as the kind of social winners. But throughout the book, you, you tell, uh, I think, really important stories 
um, and, and illustrate really strongly that the kinds of um, shared social issues that the top 10% confront that they, you know, are both implicated in, in some cases, drivers of, uh, which is fascinating. And I think to drill down into that, we, we can probably start, I suppose, by reflecting on two things. And, and maybe we'll stick with you, uh, Marcos, for, for these first two uh, questions. The first thing is, are these top 10% kind of secure in society? What I suppose are, are the sort of, um, you know, things that make them secure, but also what are the uh, threats and, and kind of issues they face? And intertwined with that is a second question really about how do they sort of perceive themselves? You know, um, are they all thinking that they're kind of rich, well off? Um, are they thinking they're kind of hard pressed, hard done to? Um, you know, what what's their kind of view? Because obviously intertwined with, I suppose, the kind of issues they're facing is this question about their view about themselves as well. Mm, yes, absolutely. Um, so in order for me to answer that, perhaps one of the things that we have to highlight is also that we decided to focus on income rather than wealth. Uh, so what people earn from generally from their employment or self-employment rather than their assets, even though those groups at the very top especially tend to coincide. And the reason for that was that we wanted to see the extent to which uh, work was seen as paying off, especially at a time when, you know, Picasso's thesis of the returns of wealth being ever more important from capital, owning capital becoming ever more important in relation to uh, wages, we thought that was particularly important. Uh, however, still, uh, when you look at a lot of research on inequality, you tend to see that most of it focuses on well, on income, sorry, and it tends to also uh, divide it into deciles. And if you see that, and you look at survey data, you definitely see patterns in relation to, for example, how uh, much how optimistic they are about the future, uh, how likely they are to, you know, declare to face difficulties in making ends meet, uh, to hold a mortgage, to um, uh, to have trust in democratic institutions, and across uh, most of those, the top, that's definitely a correlation with income. And the top, the top, the top, uh, I don't know if it was the word is better, but they declare to themselves to, you know, ha ha be a bit more secure than the rest. Uh, that is absolutely the, the case. But as I said before, also the top 10% is incredibly diverse internally. And um, even in, for example, one thing that struck us, and we mentioned it in the book, is that we looked at four countries, not just the UK. And one in particular, really, one date that really struck me about Ireland, which is that Ireland is within our sample, and I think across Europe, one of the countries with the highest uh, nominal wages. So I think it's about to break into the top 10% for them is about over 70,000 euros. Nevertheless, 28% of them, uh, and the figure was about 12% in the UK. That was some years ago before the pandemic. I declared themselves to face difficulties in making ends meet. And I think that's fascinating. Uh, now, in terms of how they perceive themselves, I think that they are, they generally, think that they are privileged in a very broad kind of nebulous nebulous sort of way and that they feel um, you know fortunate to have been born in the west to have been born in a place where uh, they could get the opportunities that allow them to thrive but they definitely never felt rich the rich were always someone else which connects to their attitudes towards tax for example because the rich are and they're never, they're never themselves the kind of people who actually should be paying more tax, they would argue. And part of their, defin their self-definition, the reason for that is perhaps because uh, in the same way that they distinguish themselves from the rest of society and the, um, from the rest of the deciles in terms of the degrees of uh, education and the kind of occupations that they have, um, they connect the fact that they attain those occupations because they were able to take take advantage of the occasional opportunities that they had and because they had to work very hard to reach where they are at the moment, uh, which means that their self-definition very often is very much entwined with uh, a sort of meritocratic ethos, 
that justifies their own position. And uh, and that metric of ESOS is definitely associated with formal employment, uh, which means that they tend to have also um, sort of meritocratic views of why others are in the position that, that they are in the first place. Uh, we cover that especially in chapter three of the book, which relates to uh, Atticus Wood's work and work in relation to how they perceive themselves and others. I don't know if there's anything money you want to uh, sort of chip in with, uh, Jerry, because I, I was going to pick up um, on their sort of social political uh, views. Yeah, I mean, one of those key findings um, that we sort of alluded to is that um, they know they're privileged, but they also think they're normal. So the top 10% basically assume that most of society leads lives similar to theirs. And um, really, like a really like headline finding from a work also was that very few, if any, knew where they sat in the income distribution. Um, and they also, um, uh, and part of this is attributed to, um, to being upward orientated. So they they might be working in workplaces which are very unequal and they're constantly looking at those above them. So as Rachel Sherman says in her, in her work, um, they're upward orientated. So they're always focusing on those above them. And, and that gives them this sort of this fear of falling that we talk about, um, this anxiety, um, and that links to the sort of difficulty in making ends meet. Um, and they also are aware that work is paying less and less. I think you can come on to that. Um, yeah, but I probably add, add those those things. Yeah. I mean, it, it is fascinating that um, you know sort of juncture where they sit between you know really quite sort of serious fears about social position. But also, you know, some elements of, um, you know, kind of self-awareness and, um, the, you know, I guess kind of recognition as a, at least some of the kinds of inequalities that have um, assisted, helped, you, you know, baked into to their sort of journey through, particularly as you talk about in the book, that their jobs. At the same time, and I'll be slightly delicate about this, there are some absolutely clueless moments <laughs> from this with your <laughs> interviewees um, and they tend to be less clueless about politics I, I thought the politics um, discussion was, was really fascinating particularly about the idea of them being politically active but the discussion of tax in particular is not eye opening if you know the kind of context but um, is and you actually use a really good example of public discourse around um, you know people who have got high incomes but don't recognise where, where they are in, in terms of um, their, their tax paying status. So sticking with you, Jerry, what are they sort of, I, I suppose, doing in terms of politics? Um, you know, but I think one of the headings in, in, in one of the chapters is, are they politically active? And then we'll, we'll move on to talk about tax and money. Yeah. Um, so the vibe we got very strongly coming through the interviews was that they just don't like what politics has become. Um, and that makes them quite nostalgic. So they're nostalgic for they kept re kept um, referring to the centre ground. Where where is the centre ground gone? Uh, one of our respondents said everything's far. Um, it's not just in politics; it's in every area of life. There's nowhere everyone can meet. The age of debate is disappearing. The age where you could persuade people of your opinion has gone. Everyone set off down a track. I don't know when it happened. They became polarised. So that yeah, this makes them very uneasy. So that sort of makes them not want to get in, involved. There's a, there's a fear there, actually, which we, I don't think we use the word fear, but there is a, f a fear of, of getting involved. And um, I, I quote um, what another respondent who, for example, wanted felt very passionately about Brexit and wanted to go and protest, um, lived outside London, wanted to go into London and protest, and his wife said, oh, no, I'll, I'll be worried about you. You, you better not, and, and, and he didn't. Um, so there's that kind of like um, not feeling that they connect to it anymore. Um, but whether they like it or not, as we sort of say, near the beginning of the book, they are more likely to vote. So they do have a disproportionate influence on policy. And this is one reason we wrote the book. And of course, they're overrepresented among the Westminster bubble. Um, you know, that they are many of our politicians, they're the policymakers, you know, as we said, they're the academics. Um, so yeah, it's a strange sort of contradic uh, contradiction. Um, and another really important finding was they're just perplexed. They just don't get the anti-elite sentiments because they're... Um, the structures that um, they can see are causing such uh, anger and, and resentment and uneasiness, and um, they see them as normal. Um, so 
you know that that's just the common sense that has run you know been part of their lives so that they they genuinely don't understand um uh and they're also i think but at the same time they're quite frustrated by um the lack of opposition, the, qu- the lack of quality in the opposition. So, like one respondent told, quality the, op- the quality of the opposition is so weak that the system is untenable. So they also don't like what the, what the whole what the whole system of politics has become. Even though they don't talk about the decline in our democracy, they they do talk about the need need for an opposition. So, um, uh, what would you add to that, Marcus? Um, yeah, I mean, I was thinking also that um, even though. If you look at uh, sort of at the local level, at the top level, to have quite a strong voice, that voice tends to be quite outwardly gendered. So I think we have a few quotes in relation to how a sort of the high earning male, for example, would uh, the fact that he earns a lot of money will allow his wife, for example, to uh, volunteer at the local school, that kind of thing. But beyond those kinds of things, uh, because they tend to define themselves through work and through their educational uh, attainment, they generally have relatively little and quite weak relationships with their local community. Um, We especially talk about it, I think it's in chapters three and four, the fact that uh, they they rarely volunteer when it's not in relation when it's not something that could uh, help them in their own careers. And that's partly because of this sort of indiv- individualized view of uh, the way that they carry that they carry out their lives. And, um, and um, yeah, they, especially perhaps around the time where they're the most likely to be earning the customer that will put them in the top 10% that's in the middle of their working lives. Uh, I'd say that. And another thing I would add is that even though uh, as Terry said, they one could say like in very broad strokes that they were quote unquote centrists and uh, very much tied to a certain view of the common sense in politics. If you look at the data, for instance, on the least deprived constituencies in Britain, they are all voted for the Conservatives, even though uh, I can't remember anyone who's, I mean, very few, um, Definitely not more than five who spoke approvingly of, say, Boris Johnson or the state of the Conservative Party around the time we were making the inter- uh, doing the interviews, which was uh, late 2018 uh, and uh, and 2019, and uh, that's quite interesting. I think that in some ways, and this is backed up by survey data, uh, we could say that this group is what we could call small L liberals in that they have relatively left of center views when it comes to things like same-sex marriage, uh, attitudes towards immigration, for example, uh, but definitely not so when it comes to economic matters. And uh, towards the end of chapter four, we discuss what, whether and to what extent those two aspects are perhaps in conflict with each other in from the point of view what's happening with the how the political debate is structured in Britain and in a lot of the West. And uh, it seems like, at least based on the results of the elections in relatively wealthy constituencies in Britain, is that the economics basically means don't, don't touch my taxes, sort of won, uh, won the day. Yeah. Yeah. So other, um, all these other issues are, are, are distant to them in some way, but um, they always say taxes and death, don't they? <laughs> but tax is really like the, the crunch point. Yeah. Jerry, do, do you want to say a bit more about that? I mean, partially um, because for a book that isn't, you know, an incredibly serious intervention, as, as you've said, actually, in, you know, almost the kind of political economy of contemporary society, the, the tax stuff is at once a moment in the book where there's a bit of levity around the absurdity of some of the positions um, that come through on tax. But also, I think, you know, Marcus is just alluded to it. it 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 tells us where i suppose the real um revealed preferences of the top 10 percent um shine through and in doing so actually sets up the kind of um third part of the book where you talk about all of the problems that the 10 percent are, are likely to encounter and what they might do about it so what what's going on with the 10 percent of the tax mm. So, um, yeah, as we say in the book, they are the, the group most likely to oppose tax hikes um, and a slight majority are against redistributive policies. Or, um, 
uh, raising taxes, like I said. But um, in the UK, the anti well, compared to the other countries in the original research we did, the anti welfare inclination in the top ten percent compared with the rest is really noticeable. Um, so I've got a quote here from Sean. Um, he was an owner of a HR consultancy, and he was in the top one percent. He said, if I'm funding people who are sitting at home and don't want to work, then I'm not happy about it. If I'm contributing to people who are below the poverty line, fine. But do I want taxes to go up for higher earners? No, I pay more than enough. Um, so they, they, there's still this this real fear that they're going to be negatively affected by any marginal hike. Um, because Partly because, as you say, we, that we develop in the, the next part of the book, they they don't see that the potential strengthening of welfare and public services will benefit them. They just they don't have that built into their their narrative. Um, so you know, and part of it is this not understanding where they are in the distribution. So you know, thinking that um, that as we said, that higher taxes should be targeted on those earning more more than they do. Um, but um, it'd be interesting to know how that how that's changed now. I have to say. Um, with all that's happened since we wrote the book, I'd, I'd really, <laughs> really like to do a um, follow up because so many things are, are um, becoming a lot, a lot clearer about the political economy. Um, and I think the one thing we do discuss later on the book is they do fear um, that the the next it's the social reproduction element. They do um, see that their that their children are not going to be able to um, they're going to they're going to need redistribution in a way that they they haven't. Um, uh, so yeah, I would say that the fact that as James Perry actually writes in our forward that it's become, it's become a lot clearer actually, since we did the research that the state's no longer able to make enough, um, to cover the social contract, um, and the current strategies that, that the past and current strategies that high owners have used are just not going to continue to protect their interests. And I think, so these, these attitudes won't be static. And actually I was just looking at, um, a recent um, report called um, 10 Years On, Piketty 10 Years On by the Fairness Foundation and together with King's College London and some of their partners. And, um, you know, now apparently even a majority of conservative voters think that the welfare gap is too, uh, the wealth gap, sorry, is too large and six in 10 think it should be reduced. And a majority of the public think that structural factors are more important in accumulating wealth and that family wealth is the most dominant factor. And I think you know what's what's happened in the last year or two will have will have helped um, shift some of those attitudes. So I think it's important to say that it was a moment in time that we wrote the book, and I I, I would imagine that if we went back to some of those respondents, they would be also reflecting um, that that more current um, data on attitudes. Um, I mean, the book does a really good job of actually foreshadowing some of the shocks, uh, both sort of uh, economic, I, I guess, primarily. Uh, that we've been living through in in the last uh, sort of two years, um, and of course, you know, in the post pandemic context, um, and you know, like you, I'd, I'd be fascinated to see not just attitudinal changes, but whether you know, when they get into the polling booth, we're going to see you know the sort of um, dominance of that uh, fear of higher taxes or even mild redistribution playing out versus the reality of, I guess, the kind of collapse really of, of the social state and the social. Uh, safety net that, that has been brought into sharp relief, uh, and and that is you know as, as I say one one of the things I really like about the book is that really is kind of clearly in there about you know these problems are coming and you know the top ten percent will will have to do something about it, and that neatly brings us back I suppose to where the book um, sort of starts to come to a conclusion. The, the book does two things towards. The end, and maybe I'll split these questions um, sort of evenly. Marcus, do, do you want to talk us through? I, I guess um, what the top ten percent kind of strategies have been for dealing with some of the social crises uh, that the book talks about, but also they've they've lived with, and and in that context, effectively, kind of why these strategies don't work, why they're counterproductive, and why the top and needs to kind of think again. Um, yes, sure. Um, I was just going to add something that to the uh, conversation we were having before and introduce one of the strategies in the process. So what are the barriers perhaps to try and understand why the top tempers of access act as they do in relation to inequality and how their actions sort of reproduce inequality is the fact that they don't tell them to see themselves as beneficiaries of the public sector or as beneficiaries 
of public services in the first place. So, for example, if you uh, propose to raise their taxes, especially when it's income tax, which is more associated with very sort of meritocratic results of the meritocratic process, uh, they don't see that as benefiting them in any way. So, uh, because they, um, be- because basically there is a sort of stigma associated with that. And in that sense, one of the main strategies to think of the top 10%, which is quite interesting, is that they, even though, as Jerry said, they think of themselves as absolutely normal, and that normality is perhaps related to the frame of reference, the kind of people they, um, they socialize with. And that's also perhaps to do with the fact that they, have particularly high levels of education, those are years spent in education, uh, they're more likely to be professionals and managers, which means that which means that they um, you know, they relate to other professionals and managers. So they are normal within that sort of environment and framework, which means that um basically they don't see their strategies as being anything other than try to protect their families as any normal person would. Uh, But at the same time, they definitely create a certain distance with others who maybe didn't have the amount of education that they did, Uh, especially those who moved from other parts of uh, the UK to London, where you often had sort of uh, narratives of having moved out. So that's one of their strategies to move out, to isolate themselves, to insulate themselves, etc. One of the key uh, metaphors that we use in the book is that of the uh, bunker. Uh, I think we mentioned the fact that some billionaires are basically building bunkers in places like uh, New Zealand to basic to <laughs> kind of try and avoid the looming apocalypse. But you don't need to have that amount of money to build that kind of smaller scale bunker as things are going, especially during the pandemic, for example, when uh, all of us were more isolated than we used to be, our lives moved online. And the way that we sort of related to the rest of the world very often was by, um, you know, accumulating, uh, getting, you know, food deliveries to your home, getting your Amazon parcel uh, delivered to your home and try to build as as much stock as possible to try and allow you to withstand whatever's going to happen in the future. And that, in some sense, you could also relate to the strategies of social reproduction as well which in some sense uh, means transforming as much as possible of your income into wealth. And that wealth could be your home. Obviously, it could be savings, but it could also be, uh, you know, private education that would allow your children to reproduce as much as possible in their position that their parents had. Uh, the issue with that sort of attempt to transform income into wealth is that it defeats the purpose of when this mute the whole idea of that the fact that we live in a meritocracy jerry what what might be some more pro-social if, if that's the right term positive things that the top 10 percent do you know we've heard from marcus about the combination of sort of preppers and you know various forms of social isolation that are driven um often by the ideologies permeating the top 10 percent but one of the things the book I mean, the book is reasonably pessimistic, but but one of the things the book does try and do um, is point to some more pro-social uh, actions that um, the top ten percent, and I suppose actually, you know, a restructuring of society might achieve. So yeah, what what would be uh, the more positive take? Well, I think it's a sort of it's a time for all of us just to have a, a bit more confidence in our relationship with what it kind of comes back to democracy in a way that we. Um, you know, a lot of the people we spoke to really didn't have much sense of empowerment, which is strange because they're, you know, they they are privileged. Um, you know, they do have this meritocratic sort of narrative. They've done well. You know, on paper, they they've got it all, but they actually had, um, you know, actually very little confidence to challenge received wisdom. From those in power, even if they're enabling wealth, the wealth, or um, working within, you know, within the world, um, e- even you know, they're, they're in, they just didn't seem very empowered. So, um, one of our messages is to que- to to be able to question, question business as usual, question common sense. You know, uh, why is the UK has been getting richer? Most people not being no better off. You know, just asking these really obvious questions. Why are childcare costs so much higher than in Europe? You know, maybe look to other countries more, um, to have the confidence to do that to question. 
Um, so I think that is quite a positive thing because I think that's a message for, for all of us, um, particularly coming up to the next general election. Um, you know, instead of asking why the NHS doesn't perform better compared to other health systems, they could ask, just flip it and say, how does it manage to perform so well when it's so clearly under-resourced? Um, and, and also just to be- try to better understand the lives of others um, by spending, you know, more more time maybe in your community. And I think that is happening definitely since we wrote the book. I think that is, um, you know, a, a thing that is just happening and, and that is positive. Um also, using public services without thinking le- less of yourself. You know, don't give yourself such a hard time. Um, because, there, there, as Marcus said, there was a real sense of status of not needing things. Um, but, you know, it's a lot more interconnected than that. So when you're using private healthcare, the doctor who's you're, you know, looking after you may well have been trained at public expense. Um, you know, we're all interconnected. Um, the business that, you know, you may be part of running, you know, will depend on the state to keep your employees healthy. So... Not not seeing a distance, but actually sort of seeing more how we're how we're interconnected, um, and I, I think that is that is a positive um, a most positive message. But I think um, I don't know if this is positive or, or negative. I think high earners will really need, hopefully, as a result of doing those other things, really need to very quickly start pushing back on the fallacy that we spend too much on public services and that our our problems stem from excessive um, state spending, and really to like you know, critique this sort of individualism, this market first high inequality paradigm and sort of step back and think, you know, actually, where has it got to us? Um, so hopefully our, our book will sort of point them in the direction of asking asking some of those questions. Which I think it does really, really well. It, it also has got a huge amount of fascinating research within it. And we've, you know, just kind of scratched the surface really of, of all of the different um, interventions that, the book makes as well as the, the sort of detailed case studies and uh, both quantitative and qualitative analysis. And in the context of a book like this, um, it, it always strikes me that there are various sort of research agendas that might flow um, from a, a book that tries to really sort of set an agenda. But at the same time, doing a project such as this um, is a big task and can be pretty exhausting. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's understandable if um, most of you have got, you know, possibly um, different uh, research directions. And if I start with you, Marcus, well, well, what are you sort of working on now? Are you thinking about more work in the kind of top 10% space or, or are you doing um, a different project? Sure. Uh, so uh, my original sort of research agenda and what I did my PhD on was uh, think tanks after moments in which... Uh, uh, after crisis in particular, uh, my book was on British think tanks after the 2008 financial crisis and tried to see how they changed intellectually and institutionally. Uh, but part of that and trying to sort of connect perhaps both research agendas is to try and see what are the networks and the sort of socioeconomic background of policy experts. That's something that I'm deeply interested in. I have a few projects in my native Chile on the matter. And more alternatively, perhaps something that I find really, really interesting and that we touch on briefly in the book and uh, but this is very tentative i don't actually know if i will pursue it but i will definitely send one or two research grant applications in relation to this it was um uh nfts and cryptocurrencies even though at the moment obviously they're not at their best moment but i think it's really fascinating the um sort of the way that they think of themselves and who are the people who actually buy and think about nfts and uh cryptocurrencies because I think behind their rise is this realization by the sales and daughters, perhaps with up 10% or of professionals and managers that work is paying less and less. So you transform so you basically everything becomes um sort of chased to for early market access and to try and build as much wealth as possible in a context in which wealth itself is very volatile too. Fascinating. What about you, Jerry? Um, so, uh, like I said um, a bit earlier, I keep coming back to democratic reform just being at the, the root of, of everything we talked about today, really, that for more of us to have a say, to have the confidence to debate, to demand accountability, transparency, scrutiny. You know, I live in a town where people didn't have the confidence to do that, and now we've got the largest, pretty much the largest debt of any uh, council in Britain. Um, and so to... 
basically encourage people in in um, whether they're young people or in the talking income desk style, it doesn't matter really, um, to have to be able to to demand accountability to ensure that policies are being implemented in the interest, you know, of the majority of us and not and not just a few. So, in the light of that, I'm really really pleased that I'm starting um some work on a project with the Foundation for European um, Progressives and Think Tank for Action on Social Change, uh, looking at young people and democracy across several European countries. But I'm also hoping on the back of the book to look into funding the production of communi communication toolkits um, for talking with by earners about a lot of these, actually what they are is taboo subjects about income and wealth um, and you know our relationship to public services. So um, yeah, there's a few things there. 